In Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, there is an exercise that really got my attention the first time I read it, and that really fits with our current worship series that is exploring how to get what we really want. Covey asks the reader to imagine that the date is three years from now and you are attending your own funeral. I know this is not a lot of fun to think about, but stick with me on this. It's three years from now and you are attending your own funeral. As you take a seat and wait for the service to begin, you look at the program in your hand and see that there are going to be four speakers. The first is someone from your family, a spouse or partner, a child, a parent, a sibling. The second is one of your closest friends. The third is a colleague, someone from your place of work or profession. The fourth is from your church or some other community organization where you have been involved. As you imagine sitting there waiting for each of them to speak, what is it that you hope they will say about you and your life? What kind of spouse or partner were you? What kind of parent were you? What kind of child were you? What kind of friend or colleague were you? What are the characteristics you would like them to lift up about who you were and the kind of life you led? What accomplishments and achievements would you like them to remember? What difference would you have liked to make in their lives? Covey then asks the reader to take some time and write down some of the answers to those questions. The purpose of the exercise is twofold. The first is that the exercise has the potential to help us discover some of our deepest values, the things we see as most important in life and that help us to define a life well lived. The other purpose is to introduce the second habit of highly effective people, beginning with the end in mind. While this habit of beginning with the end in mind is designed to help us achieve any goal we might have, it can also impact the way we live when it comes to the things that really matter. And it can help us get the things that we really want. As I have worked through this exercise, it has definitely helped me to remember the kind of person I want to be, the impact I want to make, and the legacy I want to leave. It has also revealed some of the ways I have fallen short of those goals and reminded me of how important it is to live into my ultimate values. Because when I'm able to do that, I rarely, if ever, regret where that path has taken me. I've also been reminded of the importance of keeping the end in mind when I have provided pastoral care to people who were nearing the end of their lives. With only one exception that I can remember, at the end of every one of those lives, the things people celebrated and the things they regretted were never about the money they made, the possessions they owned, or the status they had achieved in their profession or community. Instead, it was about the relationships they had and the joy that came from them, as well as the things they had done that they hoped had made a difference for other people and the world around them. A common place of regret was learning what was really important in life later rather than sooner along the journey. That one exception I mentioned, it was a man I cared for while working at Connecticut Hospice. Even to his very last words, he was demanding that his family and those around him tend to his property, his cars, his businesses, and other things he was struggling to let go of. In the days leading up to his death, he got angrier and angrier and held on more and more tightly to those things. I will never forget the moment he died. His wife, children, and some grandchildren were standing beside, around his bedside, but none of them were even close enough to touch the bed. They just stood with their backs against the wall. Even though the room was full of people, it was one of the loneliest deaths I've ever witnessed. I don't know about you, but that is not how I want my final chapter to end. And while there are times when I have fallen short of living into my deepest values, I've still got some time to impact and change what happens from here. We all do. 
Regardless of where you are on the journey of life, so long as there is breath in our lungs and the ability to communicate our thoughts, we can still shape how our life is lived and how we will be remembered. One of the best ways we can make sure that happens is to begin with the end in mind. As we think about what it is that we really want in life, not just the superficial wants and desires that we all have at various times, but the things we really want, the things that we really need and that we really value. If we can keep the end in mind, it can shape how we experience life and how other people experience us in powerful ways. While Covey's funeral exercise can be a really helpful way to discover what our deepest values and hopes for life are, as Christians, we know that our values aren't supposed to be shaped by just our own desires and wants. Instead, we are called to live into the values of our faith. The values taught to us by a Savior who not only came to grant us eternal life, but to teach us how to have a more meaningful life while still on earth. While there is certainly room for discussion about which faith values are the most essential to a life well lived, I want to focus on a scriptural lesson about some life-changing values and behaviors upon which I hope we can all agree. This lesson comes from the Apostle Paul. Now, while Paul's teachings can often seem complicated, there is this moment in his letter to the church in Galatia where his message regarding human behavior is crystal clear. Throughout his letters, Paul categorizes human behaviors into two basic areas. The first is the human, natural, selfish side that lives in all of us. Those things that often get the best of us and keeping from li- keep us from living a truly faithful life. The second area consists of the things that are of a higher value, the things that are really important and that bring us a much better experience of life. In Galatians, he refers to these two different categories of human behaviors as things of the flesh and things of the spirit. For example, here is his list of the things of the flesh. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. While this is not an exhaustive list, it does serve as an example of the kinds of things we might be drawn into by our human nature. The kind of things that pull us away from what we truly value and hope for in our lives. When it comes to these works of the flesh, Paul encourages us to keep the end in mind when we are tempted by them. To remember the importance of not trading our ultimate values for immediate pleasures. To that end, he wrote, I am warning you as I warned you before. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, just a quick word about this last passage. This is not just some warning meant to strike fear about not getting into heaven. You know, sometimes we forget that according to Jesus, the kingdom of God is not just some eternal place beyond this life that is waiting for us. It is within us. It is among us. So Paul is reminding us that when when we live into the destructive behaviors he just listed, we won't experience the kingdom of God on earth. Instead of these works of the flesh, Paul teaches that we are supposed to live into what he calls fruit of the spirit. Here is what he writes about those things. By contrast, the fruit of the spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Again, not an exhaustive list. But this one points to the kinds of things that God calls us not only to value, but to live into and exhibit throughout our lives. These are the kinds of things that God wants others to say about us, to see in us and in our lives. Think about that list of the fruit of the Spirit I just shared a moment ago. Is there anything on that list that is not of value? 
Imagine if our lives were filled with more love, joy, and peace. Imagine if we were more patient and kind with one another. What if we lived more generously, more faithfully, more gently, and with more self-control? One, 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 one of the beautiful things about these kinds of behaviors and others like them is that they not only benefit our lives, they benefit the lives of others around us and the world in which we live. While there are certainly other things I would like for people to say about me, there isn't anything on that list that I don't value and wouldn't be honored to have someone say about me and my life and legacy. One of the best ways I can ensure that happens is to keep the end in mind, to remember what it is that I want my life to represent so that when the journey of my life is over, I don't find myself looking back and wishing I had done things differently. As we think about the ways we might begin to write our life story in a new way, I want to share an image with you that I find really powerful, especially when it comes to living out our faith each day. When Jesus called his disciples, he used a very specific and very simple phrase. You, you probably remember what it was. He just said, follow me. He didn't ask them to submit or obey. He didn't force them to come. He didn't even tell them where they were going or what the journey was all about. He just said, follow me. And they went. For roughly the next three years, Jesus spent his life teaching them and all who would listen what life was meant to look like. He taught them what really mattered. Yes, some of it was complex, but most of it was pretty straightforward. Love God love your neighbor. When you stop to think about it, it really is remarkable what Jesus was able to accomplish in his three years of public ministry. I'm pretty sure that at least part of the reason he was able to do so is that from the very beginning of his ministry, he was keeping the end in mind. While there are a lot of differences between our lives and those of the disciples, the call is still the same. Follow me. The choice to answer that call is ours, and we have to make it every day, often multiple times a day. Jesus doesn't force us to say yes. Instead, he invites us to live a life of real meaning, value, and purpose. He's calling us to follow his example of keeping the end in mind so that we can make the most of every single day. And while we may not know exactly where that call will lead us or how everything will turn out, Jesus promises that if we follow him, we will find love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, and so many other things. And here's the good news. Even if we falter in the effort, if we will follow him, the kind of life we live will be one that not only leaves us satisfied at its end, but living abundantly until that moment comes. So let me ask you one more time. When it comes to the life you are living, what is it that you really want? Perhaps by keeping the end in mind, the answer to that question will become more clear. Amen.